So, um, season's greetings, everybody. Um, as we approach the holidays, it's increasingly clear that this is going to be a very different holiday from usual and that the family gatherings to which we've all become accustomed are perhaps less likely to happen to prevent the spread of, of coronavirus in the community. So you might say, well, is this just going to be miserable? I think it isn't. It's going to be different. We've seen over this year how flexible and adaptable systems are in terms of offering connectedness to things that you might usually do. That if you perhaps do go to a midnight mass or you might go to a carol concert or a, um, the Handel's Messiah in the local symphony, that things are going to be offered uh, online and differently that you can engage and enjoy. Um, although that sense of togetherness may be very different. Uh, I think we've talked previously about how the, the coronavirus restrictions are not social distancing but physical distancing and how we might then maintain social connection by whatever means possible to us to make sure that we don't lose that sense of community and family and society. Um, particularly uh, when we may be under restrictions of, of where we can go and what we can do in order to protect the well-being of ourselves and other people. When we ask how communities can engage in healthy living, I think that's probably the wrong way of putting it. It's how we can engage with our community to maximise healthy living. And it really needs a mindset of motivation. It's easy to sit on one's couch, eating a bag of chips, drinking a beer and watching the sport. It's perhaps perceived as being less easy to get out there and engage with whatever activities that might be available to us, whether that at the moment might be online or uh, in terms of uh, getting out into the mall for walking and to interact. Uh, physical distancing does not mean uh, social distancing and social, social disconnectedness, or shouldn't do so. But it does need the mindset to get out there and take advantage of, of what is there uh, to the best possible potential, potential uh, in the current climate. So and if an older person isn't connected to the to community, you might ask, well, how do you start? And I think that uh, many uh, community associations are now running um, online offerings, uh, social gatherings, other events. And again, it, it's taking that first step, a bit like learning to swim or going to school for the first time. You really don't want to do it. But when you actually take the jump, then there's great potential and great advantage in so doing. And you will only realise those um, when you get in there. Many community societies will also reach out to people uh, to en engage their interests, but often it's up to us that that idea of I am in control of my destiny and I have to make the best of what I'm able to rather than become isolated, uh, become lonely. And again, we know that social isolation and loneliness is associated with both you know, poor, healthy ageing behaviours, but also uh, an increased depression and poor health outcomes. So it's, it's taking the leap. How do you then motivate people to take that leap to become, that leap to become connected? Uh, there are befriending schemes. There are seniors volunteers. Uh, we know that um, seniors befriending schemes online who have no uh, family or friends. And certainly at the moment where re visiting is restricted, those schemes are of great value. Connected ageing versus isolated ageing. Um, there, there, there are clear research data which support the idea of connectedness in later life. Maintaining connectedness through social activity, maintaining connectedness through intellectual activity uh, and reducing the uh, sense of isolation and loneliness. We know that um, both isolation and loneliness are uh, associated with adverse health outcomes. We know that the less likely you are to get out of your house uh, and see other people or engage with physical activity, 
the more likely you are to have a poorer quality of life, experience uh, poorer mental health, and actually have more complications from any chronic medical conditions. And that's okay for populations. It becomes there and very hard to bring that down to the level of the individual. But again, uh, overcoming that barrier of inhibition from engaging becomes the crucial first step. And there are you know, services, community societies, other voluntary organizations which can, which can engage with you to allow you to then uh, take that first step uh, and uh, start the process. Over the last 20 to 30 years, we've seen uh, an increasing number of older people who are uh, aging alone. That's because of changes in demographic, because of an increasing divorce rate in the over 50s, uh, and obviously uh, an increasing likelihood of an experience of a major life event, the death of a partner, for instance. So whereas um, isolation is really described as living alone, the sense of loneliness that might come with it um, is associated with poorer health. We know that people who are, are isolated or lonely are less likely to engage with others. We know they're less likely to, for instance, uh, take regular exercise, more likely to not give up smoking, uh, more likely to drink more than people who are not isolated and connected. So these healthy aging behaviours are, are less likely to be taken up by people who are um, isolated. Uh, but more importantly, those people who declare themselves lonely uh, have even poorer health outcomes, uh, both in terms of physical health and uh, mental health. And they're more likely to experience um, early mortality because of that. So uh, you know, we don't routinely screen for loneliness. It becomes an important thing to talk about. Um, there are very simple screening measures um, to ask about it, and uh, but then we're not really equipped very well in the health system to deal with it. Uh, how do we prescribe connectedness? Uh, and that becomes again that uh, initial leap thing, but how can we um, create voluntary or statutory services which are designed to combat the impact of, of isolation and loneliness? For some, entering a congregate or community living setting um, will be a very positive thing. Um, you know, many people want to live in their own home, um, but they may create a prison wall where they don't see anybody. Um, and having a structure and an engagement and society enveloped around them may be of great benefit. But again, it becomes personal choice. But, but for populations, we do know the negative impact of isolation and loneliness on older people. Active living communities, therefore, potentially, will be very good. So they, they might not necessarily be congregate facilities, but one could envisage almost social engineering communities of older people that have younger people in there, and the younger people ha are employed, for instance, with uh, doing activities of dealing with which older people need help. Uh, so we've got a, an age non-specific retirement community, if you like, a, a healthy living campus which is multi-generational, engaged with its community. So as we get older, the chances of us getting an another medical problem are quite high. Uh, and as we know, we go through life, as you might expect some of us, collect diseases and conditions. I think it's beholden upon all of us to uh, become educated about those conditions and their management and take responsibility for their management uh, to the maximal uh, extent. That means engaging with the healthcare system appropriately, uh, getting advice. Uh, we know that uh, people with multiple medical conditions spend a lot of time uh, looking after those conditions. Uh, and our modern healthcare system may actually make that worse because we have evidence-based guidelines based on looking after, say, one condition and then another condition, 
and seldom is there integration uh, of the problem and a rationalisation of those things we might need to do. Uh, and as doctors in single organ specialties, we don't always take account of the burden on the individual or the, to, or the environment in which that person exists. So I think the, the, the main message from this particular uh, question is make sure that we have good primary care uh, physicians or healthcare providers who are able to take an holistic view of, of, of us uh, with all of our healthcare problems in the situation in which we find ourselves in the environment and the burden upon us of managing that. So we've got good education, good healthcare literacy, that consistent relationship with a primary care uh, healthcare provider who can become uh, knowledgeable about us and can take into account all of those multiple factors that are in play to allow us to get the best outcomes for our health as possible.